Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can I ask that all mobile devices are switched off and put away? Agenda item one is public petitions, and um, we have two petitions to look at today. Can I refer members to <coughs> excuse me, paper one? Um, paragraph two sets out what actions are available to us today. Petition PE1372. Access to Justice in Environmental Matters by Duncan McLaren on behalf of Friends of the Earth. Um, calls on the Scottish Government to clearly demonstrate how access to the Scottish Courts is compliant with the R House Convention. Can I ask members for any comments on this, please? Oliver. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I would be keen to keep this petition open because I don't feel... Uh, that uh, we've we, we, we've kind of satisfactorily got to um, you got as far as we can, we can go with it, and um, I would certainly uh, be, be keen uh, that we uh, at least wait until the Scottish government publishes um, its response to the consultation. Um, I'd also uh, be keen uh, that we uh, take some further action uh, and maybe write to the Scottish Civil uh, Justice Council um, to. To, to, to seek further uh, clarification um, on how uh, the courts um, plan to uh, plan to reform um, and what impact this has on access to justice in this area. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, convener. I, I would agree with um, the, the comments that Oliver Mundell um, has made. I remember this petition from last session when I was on um, this committee, and this is a, a long-standing um, issue. And I think we, we, we need to keep it open to find some some resolution. So I would agree with the um, suggestions that Oliver has, Oliver Mundell has made. Okay. Any more comments? Everyone content with those actions? Yes. Agreed. Okay. Um, uh, the second petition that we are considering is PE1695, Access to Justice in Scotland by Ben and Evelyn Mundell. This petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to take action to ensure that access to justice, including access to legal advice from appropriately trained lawyers and financial support through legal aid, is available to enable people in Scotland to pursue cases where they consider their human, a human rights breach has occurred. Um, can I welcome uh, Dave Stewart, MSP, with us this morning. Um, the, he's the regional MSP for the petitioners. Um, can I invite comments from members or members content for Mr Stewart to speak? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Committee. And can I welcome also the Mandels to the gallery today? You'll probably know from the papers that um, I've spoken, I think, three times previously at the Public uh, Petitions uh, committee, and perhaps I can just give some very basic uh, background uh, information. So, as I said when I spoke previously, the petitions committee, um, on the surface, looks this looks like a highly complicated um, case, and there is elements that aren't complicated. Um, so, on the surface, it's about the ring fencing of dairy farmers' milk quotas within the Southern Isles uh, ring fenced area. However, it's a much more fundamental issue to me. It's about how ordinary families on a modest income can seek redress uh, on justice. And I think, obviously, this committee is something they would accept is very important. And I, I noticed to uh, the your annual report last year that you yourself can really made that point that human rights is vitally important. So the simple answer, of course, at one level, uh, is we should seek, families should seek uh, redress through the legal system. And of course, that's right. But you'll know from my presentation to the Public uh, Petitions Committee that the family have been in touch with over 50 uh, law firms. Uh, by person or by phone. Now, the vast majority of these firms um, would not deal with human rights cases. So that was the first problem. And many of the cases that did would only deal uh, with prisoners or migration, immigration issues. So there's a big restriction straight away. So one lawyer, for example, agreed to take up the case, wanted an upfront payment of 25,000 before proceeding. And at the time, that represented double the family's yearly disposable income. So the Mandels have told me that many farmers in the ring fence area were placed in an impossible situation with a milk price that was below the cost of production, uh, leading effectively to the forfeit of their property. At the time, the quota was worth probably around 450,000, which is obviously a massive sum uh, relative to their current uh, income. And as identified the Public Petitions Committee, my view is this could be a potential breach of Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So just set some context, at the time of the ring fencing, in the UK as a whole, there were 36,000 dairy farmers who had this asset, which was the milk quota. And they were perfectly free 
to realise the full value of this quota uh, to assist their business. But less than 200 people within the ring-fenced area were denied this right. They were denied the right to trade or to swap or to sell on uh, their milk quota for the complicated reasons uh, about the ring-fencing. So I feel that was a real, a real breach. I'm conscious of time, Camille, just a, perhaps a couple of quick quotes uh, to finish. Um, I was pleased that the First Minister set the advisory group up on human rights leadership. And if I can quote from that report, uh, progress then has evidently made on Scotland's journey. However, it's cru uh, critical to acknowledge that there are gaps and shortcomings too. Too many people are not enjoying their rights in everyday life. All this leads to a denial of access to justice. It's a matter of political choice and priorities. What is needed is the political will to implement the solutions. And my final quote, I think it's quite relevant, um, is from Judith Robertson, who will be well known to you all, um, <coughs> from the Scottish Human Rights Commission. She appeared before the House of Commons and the Lords Joint Committee. <coughs> Excuse me, and she said in 1918, uh, not 1918, but old for that, 2018, she said, the cheapest way to ensure that rights are delivered is to ensure that they're not breached. She went on to say, it's difficult for anyone to take the case in Scotland. We have no power to support anybody who will do that. In fact, we are expressly disallowed. So in a sense, in Scotland, we're at a disadvantage because the UK body obviously has different rights. So in conclusion, um, I've read the reports to the committee and I think there were some recommendations uh, which I would wholly um, urge the committee to look at. I think it's in paragraph 43 of your papers. So the suggestions are um, referral to SRH consortium, uh, Just Right Scotland, consider consultation on legal aid and uh, access the faculty of advocates, uh, particularly around legal advice. I think that's very sensible suggestions. I think there is a huge gap here. I think there's unfinished business for Scottish human rights, and it's well illustrated by the Mandels, but I would stress they are just an illustration of the other families that were affected. Many of them, and I don't have a complete track, obviously, but many of them have gone out of business because of this disastrous position. And they weren't, they weren't trading, uh, in a sense, um, not illegally or in a subsidy. What they had was a great asset. And the fact the average in the now is we're actually short of dairy farmers in many, in many parts and short of milk. So this, is, this was a very poor decision. The only way we can address that, of course, is through the court system. Ultimately, it's got the European Court of Human Justice. But if you can't get to first base, you can't do that. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions if I, if I can come here. Okay, thank you. Do you have any comments from uh, members of the committee? Oliver. Hi, thank you, convener. I just say I'd fully support the... Uh, points that we've just heard, because I think they've been uh, well set out, um, and I would be content to take the actions at paragraph uh, 43. Um, I would also be keen mm -hmm. to ask the Scottish Government uh, for their views on the issues the case raises more generally, um, and also uh, to ask uh, when they expect the uh, analysis of the uh, legal aid consultation to be published. Mm -hmm. um, Thank and you. I'd be keen to keep it open, obviously. Okay. Mary? Thank you, um, convener. I'm <coughs> grateful to Mr Stewart for his um, very helpful um, remarks and I, I am keen to um, keep this petition open and um, write to the Scottish Human Rights Consortium and, and Just Right Scotland, but I, I think it might be helpful, given this is a human rights um, issue, and while the Mundells are only one of uh, many families that, that are affected, I wonder if Mr Stewart um, perhaps could give us some detail of the personal impact this has had on, on the Mundells, because I think it would be helpful for the committee to hear that. Um, so you can be, I'm happy to do that. I've dealt with the, I dealt with the family, I think, for probably about seven years now. And, I mean, it has been probably one of the most tragic cases I've dealt with in 12 years in, in the Parliament. Um, the Mandels have got a great history in farming. Uh, Mr Mandel was telling me yesterday he's been a farmer for 50 years. I think he said he was 74, if I remember it rightly. Um, and fat farming is in his blood. His father farmed, and I think there's a history of grandfather as well. So, first of all, there's been a great history of farming in that particular area. Um, but taking away the whole court issue has effectively ruined the farm. Um, they were telling me yesterday, I'm sure they won't mind me telling you this, that they, you know, they have great assets in the farm in terms of houses and, and various farming facilities, but they're just in a position where they can't afford the maintenance of the house, and, and effectively it's going to rack to ruin, which is a real tragedy considering the, the history. And they're, they're keeping the farm going effective for their son, who's got also got medical issues. So it is a tragedy, because this was a good going business, and was effectively ruined <coughs> by a bureaucratic decision with unintended consequences. And um, the, it would be interesting if we could track the 200 families, because I would suggest there's probably very few now in farming. Okay, 
Thank you. Fulton Tuesday. Yeah, thanks, well, I, I agree with uh, what's been said already, and I would, um, I would also agree with the recommendation to keep the um, petition open. I wonder whether, as well as the um, the organisation bodies um, that we could write to the committee about the, the Law Society of Scotland as well for their mm. um, views on the matter. I'm being told that the Law Society have actually provided their views to the petitions um, oh, right, okay. committee, so we can we can reference we can, them. We can reference yeah. them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener, and welcome to the Mandels to the Gallery. I, I, I think reading the papers, I hadn't really fully anticipated the human cost of this mistake, um, and I, I've been quite shocked by what David Stewart has told us in terms of the, the history of this case. So in addition to writing to the government, I think based on what they come back with, I want to hold up, open the opportunity to actually have representatives of the government come in for further questioning about this, because I think not only should we keep this... Uh, petition open, but it is such a, a live and pressing human issue that I think we should actually ask questions in open committee about this. Um, yeah, briefly, Mr. Chair. I think one issue I perhaps didn't highlight sufficiently is the committee may well have addressed the role of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, which obviously are an excellent organisation, but the quote I gave from Judith Robertson was effectively talking about the fact that their hands are tied in Scotland about being able to directly deal with cases. Is this something the committee has previously addressed? If not, it might be quite useful. I mean, obviously, if there was a change in regulations, um, that, would, that would allow direct representation, which I think happens to the UK body, if my memory serves me uh, correct. But it's certainly, it's certainly worth looking at why is there an impediment? Because that is the problem we have. We cannot access the law. I think yeah, these are issues that are, are all live to, to the committee. Um, we seem to have consensus on the actions that we'll take. So if everyone's in agreement? Yeah. Okay, agreed. And we'll suspend briefly to okay. um, change witnesses. Thank you. Okay, um, welcome back. Agenda item two is female genital mutilation, protection and guidance. Oral evidence session and can I welcome Christina McKelvey, Minister for Older People and Equalities, Trevor Owen, Bill Team Leader and Nicholas Duffy, Senior Principal Legal Officer um, with the Scottish Government. You're all very welcome this morning. Um, Minister, we have around an hour um, to question you, so we're going to be very disciplined in our questions and I know you'll give um, concise um, answers as well. Um, can I invite you to make an opening statement of up to three minutes, please? Yeah, good, good morning and thank you so much for having me along to committee. I'm really pleased to be giving evidence to the, this committee today on the Female Genital Mutilation Protection and Guidance Scotland Bill. As we know, FGM is a physical manifestation of deep-rooted gender inequality. It is an illegal and unacceptable practice which violates the human rights of girls and young women. Uh, this government's position is absolutely clear. This is simply unacceptable and we are committed to preventing FGM and protecting all girls and women who are at risk from FGM. The law and non-statutory guidance we have in place at the moment works. I want to be clear about that. But this bill takes things a wee bit further by strengthening that law and placing a greater focus on prevention and protection of women and girls at risk. The bill puts in place a specific FGM measure, a protection order, which means our public services and our courts are able to focus on the need to protect those persons at risk. Building on the experience of other jurisdictions in the UK and reflecting on the support of our consultation, this is an effective and proven approach to reducing risk to potential victims. So under the bill, FGM protection orders will be made by a court and be unique to each case, so very individualistic, and they will contain conditions to protect girls and women from FGM. Further, they will also be able to be used by law enforcement agencies against those who wish to perpetrate this terrible crime, restricting their activities and even where no potential victim has been identified. 
To support the new protection orders, the Bill places a duty on ministers to issue statutory guidance on the protection orders and also a power to issue guidance on FGM more generally. But crucially, public bodies will be required to have regard to that guidance, and that's a very important point to make. As evidence to the committee has shown, this bill must be part of a holistic approach. We understand that uh, to tackle an FGM, and we know there's no single solution uh, to end this practice. The bill is very much part of our national action plan for preventing and eradicating FGM, and we're making progress in implementi implementing the action plan. And the year three progress report published last Friday provides more detail, and I know that that was provided to the committee last week. I hope that was helpful. A key component of the plan is to improve the provision of services and support to those affected by FGM and to ensure that people and communities play a central role in shaping the services, policy and statutory guidance. So the people being absolutely central to shaping that guidance. It was clear in the evidence to this committee that the involvement of communities is key to the success of the programme of work and I agree with you on that. I am very committed to taking forward a comprehensive programme of engagement and involvement as we implement the bill. So nothing about them without them is really the, the watchword for me. Our approach to tackling it in Scotland driven through the National Action Plan must be considered. It must be collaborative and be community-based. And in this way, we can make sure that what we do actually helps prevent FGM, provides protection for those at risk, provides the support required, and through participation, gives a voice to the people and communities affected by this practice. This bill, alongside the National Action Plan, therefore, I believe, is the right mix of prevention and protection. And I'm very happy now, convener, to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. Um, can I start by asking um, what evaluation you undertook to um, ensure that the measures um, proposed, that the protection orders, um, are necessary? Yeah, well, you, you'll know about the work of the, the National Action Plan, and that's been ongoing now for a number of years, and the organisations and the groups and the young women that have been involved in that. So continuing on from that piece of work, we obviously held a statutory consultation. 80% of the stakeholders suggested we needed these two measures, and that's, that's basically where we started our work from. So ensuring that a protection order is in place in order you know, to, to make sure that you know, young people especially young, you know, specifically young women, are not put at risk. So that was why when we worked with the stakeholders and they came back with such a resounding uh, result in the consultation, we felt that this was the best way forward to bring forward quite a tight bill with two provisions in it, really, statutory guidance and protection orders. Thank you. Um, we've heard some evidence that there's currently a, a, a gap in, in child protection for 16 and 17-year-olds. Um, do you agree with that? And have you identified any other gaps in, in current practice? Um, we, I've, I've, I've heard that evidence about um, the, the gap in uh, 16 to 17 year olds. And this provides targeted pr protection for, for those uh, under 16 and those over who fall out with the child protection system, um, who are not maybe deemed vulnerable enough to be part of the adult protection system. But crucially, Absolutely crucially, we want to wrap around uh, and continue in the level of protection for a girl at risk, even if she moves on from child protection system and becomes a young adult. So the care, the attention and the support and the protection will all continue. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the protection orders will be unique to each case. Um, that ex um, accepting that, obviously, but could you explain to the committee how they'll work in practice and perhaps give... An example, we're always keen to hear what it will actually mean for a young um, girl or woman at risk. How will it help them? Yeah, there's, if, you, if you have a, a quick look at the policy document, you will see there's a few case studies in there um, where we looked at, you know, examples. Because I, for me, I quite like to see how this, how is this going to work for real people. Uh, and that's, that's where we, we take that piece of work from, is how has it worked in other jurisdictions? And we've used that in order to do that. So you, you're absolutely right, you know, there's, there's a, the, that we have to, you know, make sure we understand all of this. And we've used some of that case study uh, to do that as well. So it's in the policy document. If that's helpful for you, um, I could direct you there. Committee, can you um, tell us who could who can raise an order, you know, and what the process will be? So I think it's, now, let me get my memory right. I think it's section 5C, 5B, the 
bill, 5C, I was right the first time, uh, it gives you, a, you know, a, a list of people there who can bring forward a bill. We suspect, a, a protection order, sorry, we suspect you know, it will be mostly local authorities and possibly individuals themselves who, who could look for a protection order. But in that list, it's not exhaustive um, and it's pretty open, so that's continued, uh, contained uh, in the heart of the bill at Section 5. Um, and there's a whole list of individuals and organisations within that, but we suspect it will be local authorities and possibly on you know, rare occasions individuals themselves. Okay, thank you. In England, it's mandatory to record FGM in a patient's health care record. Um, and from September 2014, it became mandatory for acute trusts to collate and submit basic anonymised details about the number of patients treated who had FGM to the Department of Health every month. Um, guidance from the Chief Medical Officer advises clinical staff in Scotland to record cases of FGM and that this would be monitored by ISD. Are you able to update us on that at all? Yeah, well, you'll know that the Chief Medical Officer issued that guidance in, the, uh, in a letter form in 2014 to, to all uh, health boards and um, NHS authorities. Um, where, where the service is most likely to come across this condition is, is in those, those places. So uh, to record and diagnose the types of FGM are clinical matters, so that's why the Chief Medical Officer takes responsibility for that. But our current multi-agency approach uh, contains an expectation that all agencies should gather, record and collate that data. And we're currently working through the FGM action plan on ways that, that we can do that. The implementation group are incredibly important in this work because we want to make sure that we record the data that we need, but we record it in a way and in a sensitive way that helps us understand the issue as well, helps professionals understand the issue and therefore give uh, the right support. And um, we're working very, very closely with NHS boards and H NHS uh, data uh, collection agencies to do that appropriately through the implementation group, again, working alongside the community to make sure we get it right. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, so the Law Society told the committee that uh, children's hearings should be able to grant FGM protection orders, um, although Liz Owens from Social Work um, Scotland expressed doubts and suggested that the court's process would be more sensitively, a more sensitive area for this to happen. Um, what's your view as to whether children's hearings should be able to grant FGM protection orders? Yeah, well, you'll know that children's hearings and panels are called for specific, you know, a spe specific purpose, which is a compulsory supervision order and all the things that go along that. So all of the issues that would, uh, you know, refer a child to a panel would be taken into account. But if you look at FGM is actually a Schedule 1 offence and a Schedule 1 offence actually triggers a referral to the panel. So that measure is already in place to allow us to do that. Um, so I could be, you could be reassured, you know, that the Law Society has raised, you know, an important point, but we think because... FGM is treated as a Schedule 1 offence, then the, the automatic trigger to the panel would, would happen there. There's obviously other ways to trigger, you know, referrals to the panel too, and there's many measures uh, contained within this. Child protection is child protection, and child abuse uh, is one way that we should make sure that we protect our children, and if a compulsory supervision order is needi needed, and the intervention of a panel is needed, the mechanism is there to do that. And given the scarcity of examples of FGM, that it's not something that will come across um, most panellists in the entire duration of their service on a children's panel, um, and the very cult particular cultural sensitivities around it, do you think there's a cause or case for particular training of panel members in this area? Well, there's always you know, um, opportunities for training and I would always, um, being a former social work training officer myself, I would always uh, say that people should take up those opportunities. But interestingly, the evidence that you heard from, um, you know, panel members, um, I think it was a principal reporter that you heard from, um, suggested, you know, that you, the measures that they felt that were in place now were, were enough and that was enough to take forward and that the normal process of the children's hearing system, such as compulsory super, supervision orders, were, at, were actually sufficient. So there's always opportunities to do training and part of the training of the wider aspect of protection orders and the guidance will be taken forward as part of the a part of the implementation group so you can be assured if there is bodies out here there who think you know they should be uh, involved in that that there will be some work done to ensure that we make sure we all of that information to the right places and therefore when it does come up as you say maybe on that rare occasion people are ready uh, for it um, the implementation group and the national action plan uh, group um, are very well versed in working with other organizations and all of this uh, and they're doing a lot of awareness raising you know the general policy 
of FGM is something that's been illegal for a long time. Um, and there's lots of training already out there for the purposes of this bill. We're looking at how we use protection orders and how we can use the statutory guidance to make sure that people understand their role um, in protecting girls and women. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oliver. Thank you, uh, convener. I wanted to ask about free uh, legal aid or um, advice, because um, obviously it's not automatic in this bill, but we've heard from a number of uh, witnesses that they would like it uh, to be so, uh, partly uh, because of some of the difficulties we've seen in, in, in uh, sort of bringing uh, F FGM uh, cases uh, in the past, and they think that there's a, maybe a special case uh, around this bill to, to, to put that in place to prevent uh, barriers. Yep, yep. No, it's, it, it's a, a point well made. Um, can I maybe just give you a wee bit of information about how the legal aid system maybe works? I think some of the evidence you took was about how legal aid works in other jurisdictions in, in the UK. But in Scotland, we expect the vast majority of cases where an FGM protection order is sought will be by a public body where legal aid doesn't apply. So that, that's one, one case. There's maybe a, a situation um, where, you know, the parents of a, a child would bring forward a case and that would go through the normal procedure of being, you know, um, wealth and um, financial uh, support tested in that sense. Um, in most of these cases, I, I think you would find that, you know, people would uh, be um, li liable and, and be supported by legal aid in that, that, that way. Um, can I maybe give you a wee bit of understanding as well that in uh, 2018, the independent, independent strategic review into legal aid, rethinking legal aid, legal aid highlighted that Scotland's current legal aid spend per head is the third highest in the European Union. So we spend quite a lot of money and about 75% of those people who are financially eligible for some form, form of legal aid get it in Scotland, uh, as opposed to maybe only about 25% in the rest of the UK. So we think we've got quite a robust system. I think given the individualistic, uh, you know, point of a protection order, whether it would be someone other than a local authority bringing it forward, we think we've got the right measure of support in there and understanding. Uh, and I suspect that, you know, people would get the support they need to take forward a case. Um, also, I, 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 also, just quickly, because um, it just struck me that if it's an individual bringing it forward and it's not the parents and it's a young person themselves, then they would qualify for that type of support too. Uh, th thank you. I'll just push back on that a little bit because I think I probably don't need to, to, to say to you, you know, there are many people who, who find frustration and delays uh, with legal aid. They find the process very complicated. Uh, uh, parents who are maybe uh, going to come forward in this could be in particularly uh, vulnerable situations and, and you know, and, and, and uh, th there might be a matter of urgency. Uh, I, I would just be concerned uh, that, that, that legal aid might put a barrier in place uh, for, for people uh, when, when making very, very difficult decisions, particularly some of the people we've met during it. And it's just, again, you know, whether you think that there could be, uh, you know, that in terms of that initial uh, sort of le legal advice uh, to, to get a case going, uh, w whether there's anything extra that could be put in place in, in this case? Um, it's something I can, uh, we can certainly consider. Um, that takes it a wee bit a step further than, than the current arrangements we have in place, which I think are robust and supportive enough. Um, but if you think there's, there's other measures that we should take forward, I'm very, very happy to, to hear those and to take them away and consider them and come back to you on that. Um, that, that, that that's very helpful because it sort of links into my next question because we had some evidence last week uh, from the National FGM Centre, uh, which I think covers uh, certainly England. Um, and I just wondered whether that's something uh, you would consider, because we've obviously got the, the National uh, Implementation Group, but it's just whether uh, through the early stages uh, of, of the orders, whether you think that there could be a sort of national uh, sort of individual or sort of service that could, pr could provide support to uh, individuals under Section 5C uh, you know, who, who were taking these protection orders forward without the support of a local authority or uh, other, other government agency? Certainly something that we will take up with the implementation group and the groups we're working with because we, what we want to do is make sure that the stakeholders are at the heart of all of this uh, and the communities that would maybe be affected by it at the heart of all of this as well. And if that's something that they think they need, I don't think it's something they've raised with us directly yet, but if it's something they think they, they need, I'm certainly happy to hear that and see where we can work together on it. Thank you. Um, we heard sort of generally about the support uh, th through the National FGM Centre um, and we've also taken evidence from Liz Owen from Social Work Scotland uh, about the support that would surround uh, the sur surround the FGM protection orders. 
Um, do you have any sort of ideas on how you plan uh, to meet the sort of broader support needs? Uh, we've heard concerns about housing um, and uh, about sort of longer term impacts on, on, on uh, health. Um, and it's just you know, what, what, what support do you think will will be put in place to sit alongside the protection orders. Okay, so that, that's that's a bit wider than the this, this, this scope of the bill that we're looking at today, and I'm, I'm happy to, to hear some of that. Uh, you'll know that the FGM has been, you know, in a legal practice for, for more than 10 years now, and many, in, in all social work uh, settings, I suspect that they are well versed in some of the issues that would arise, especially, you know, in, in communities where they've got um, a some interventions and all that already in place. Um, and it, it strikes me that there's maybe another piece of work that we need to be doing with the implementation group and talking to some of the professionals, which we have done. We spent you know, a, a really uh, informative day in the summer with all of these organisations talking about some of the wider challenges. Um, I'm not sure what you mean about housing and health and whether you maybe want to drop me a wee note on the wider uh, implications of that, or if, if if convener is going to indulge yeah. you to yeah, exactly. quickly go into that now, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that ties into the, you know, the, the bill that we're looking at in front of us now, because that's about protection orders and guidance, and there may be a space and guidance for some of this. Yeah, um, no, certainly I can talk to. You. I mean, the convener uh, was with me uh, on a visit uh, where we went to, uh, to visit an organisation based here in Edinburgh who, who works uh, with some of the people this bill will, will hopefully help, and their concern really was uh, that. You know, the, the protection order could do the, the legal bit, uh, but ultimately for, for some of the individuals you know, who are uh, sharing, sharing a house with someone who might want to go ahead with FGM practices, um, you know, they, they, they wouldn't feel confident to come forward uh, because they wouldn't necessarily have somewhere to, to live if that relationship, family relationship broke down. Um, and then there were sort of concerns around how people might financially support themselves uh, quickly again in, in, in cases where uh, family relationships have, have broken down and it's just whether or not you know part of protecting people is making sure that they that, that they have access to those other services uh, that, that, that would sit round about and I think last week in terms of health you know we heard that a number of people uh, would benefit from longer term uh, counselling uh, or, or other support because obviously uh, going through these uh, uh, through, through the legal process and revisiting uh, traumatic experiences from the past can, can be very, very difficult for people, particularly uh, those uh, you know, who, who are maybe, uh, who maybe on, you know, on, on the margins of society in, in the first place. And it's just whether uh, we could encompass within the protection orders you know, a, a sort of element of, of support or make sure that that was that, you know, that, that, that those things could, could be part of, of, of the protection order. Mm -hmm. and it's as Oliver said, we, we were on a um, visit in the summer, and just to give the, the, the specific example, um, the woman um, who was affected or her child was potentially affected, the choice, if, if you can call it a choice <laughs> available to her, would be to move across the city um, and be in emergency temporary accommodation. And I think that probably what um, struck us was that whilst the protection orders could give that legal protection if someone is and, there, and you'll know there are multiple um, challenges and issues affecting people that are uh, none of this happens in isolation and um, this particular woman was a um, victim of domestic abuse and um, so whilst we absolutely recognize you're here talking about the bill I think um, for us focusing on um, the, the women and girls that it's going to protect it's important for us to see how, how things join up and that that you know their the protection order will give them a choice and help help them no no ab absolutely I, I understand where, where you're coming from now um, a protection order will be able to direct local authorities to put in place that that type of support uh, and you may be interested in the work that um, has just been announced around about barring orders for domestic violence situations you may also know that um, a schedule one offense can remove either you know a perpetrator or a potential perpetrator from a, a situation as well to protect the 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 the, the person at risk and um, all of these measures will be available in, in these cases as well so I hope that would, would give you some reassurance around around that as well on the health issue you will maybe uh, know because you've probably done not some of the visits yourself that we are currently funding Waverly Care and Sahelia and other organizations to do some of that really direct work in supporting people in a way that's culturally sensitive as well because um, sometimes you know maybe it, 
the statutory authorities um, uh, need the support of you know, people who are working in the community. So, so if you take Sahelia, uh, for instance, that's all women you know, who have had um, either lived experience or um, have supported people with lived experience uh, of FGM and other um, culturally sensitive uh, issues around about how they, how they handle that, honour-based violence and stuff. And, and, and we, we actually you know, look to them as the experts in ensuring that people get the right support as well. But local authorities can certainly direct uh, people to that support and the uh, protection order can direct local authorities to take responsibility for ensuring that happens. That, that's excellent and I'm glad we continued because I think that's uh, been, been something for the whole committee that we'd be very pleased uh, is, is, is the case. Uh, my final question um, was, was a specific one um, last week. Uh, Lethan Bartholomew um, from the National FGM Centre um, had highlighted um, his concerns that some uh, paediatric doctors uh, may not have the expertise to examine uh, women and girls for, or girls, sorry, for uh, FGM uh, and that they might be reluctant uh, to do so. Um, even, even, uh, you know, or even reluctant as well to give evidence in court. Um, how do you plan to ensure that professionals uh, feel confident in dealing with such cases uh, here in Scotland? It's, it's not something that's been raised with us before, and I did hear that evidence myself yeah. last week, so I instructed officials to go away and look, at, uh, look into it uh, for us. And um, we have since um, reached out to the National FGM Centre to get some more information on what Mr Bartholomew was speaking about last week. So certainly that's, that's the measures we've taken since we heard the evidence last week. Um, currently, territorial health boards in Scotland have agenda-based violence leads. So they have people um, who support the development of staff and, the, and their capacity, an FGM. So I think you could be reassured that there's people, you know, taking the lead on each uh, territorial health board for that. Each board also has a clinical lead for FGM uh, and some boards have specialist midwives um, where, where they've been needed to work with pregnant women who have a history of FGM and ensure their safety and well-being during the course of their pregnancy and uh, delivery. The development of statutory guidance I think will be a good place to ensure that you know we have this firmly rooted. It will build on what we already have, which I've just explained, but where we can maybe go next in ensuring that that expertise, that capacity building and that understanding is there within all of our health professionals who would maybe be at the front line of some of this as well. So statutory guidance would be a good place, I think, to develop some of that. Happy to hear if you've got any ideas on how we could do that, but also uh, you know, just again saying that we'll be working with the implementation group to make sure we get this absolutely right. Thank you. Mary. Thank you, um, convener and minister. You mentioned guidance, and it was guidance my uh, that, that I wanted to, to ask you about initially. And I have three questions, so I'll, I'll roll them into to, to one to, to help us with um, our, our time. Um, the, the bill obviously gives a power to introduce statutory guidance, and I wonder. My first question is: Why is it so important that the guidance is statutory and not advisory? And what do you think should be in both the general statutory guidance on FB FGM and the statutory guidance on the protection orders? Is there something that should be in both those sets of, of, of guidance? And my final question on guidance is, who will be responsible for ensuring that the guidance is followed? And will that be monitored at a national level? Okay, that is three big questions rolled, <laughs> rolled into one. I suppose the straight answer about statutory versus advisory is both both exactly what they say on the tin, isn't it? The statutory guidance is something that has to be have due regard taken to uh, an understanding of and, and uh, taken forward in that way. Advisory, you know, could, could be advisory and, and open to interpretation. So that's why we want to work really closely with the implementation group. We get the statutory guidance as sharp, as clear and as on point as possible, which means that that's, you know, there's no room for interpre interpretations and there's no room for perceptions in there. So that's why we feel statutory guidance, along with protection orders, and it's something we already do in child protection and other adult protection where we have statutory guidance attached to that. So the professionals know exactly what they need to do, when they need to do it and how they need to do it. Um, and it makes the whole process uh, much more supportive uh, as well. I, I think I'm not sure what you mean by what should be in both. If you've got an idea there, I'm happy, happy, happy to hear it and I would be really keen to hear that as well but if you look at maybe um, 12 page 12 of, the, of, of our year, year three report which um, we managed to get out a wee bit sharper than, than we anticipated so that you, the committee could have it um, you will see quite clearly there about um, how that highlights the sets of guidance and how we should use the guidance as well but a wee bit of clarity maybe from you about what you mean by both what should be in both sets of guidance well, there, there is general statutory guidance on FGM 
and there will be statutory guidance on the protection orders. And it was just if there was a crossover in, in, in what should be in both sets of guidance. Hmm. Or will... Yeah, I'm going, <coughs> to ask, I'm going to ask Trevor to come in on this, because I think that's... <coughs> some simple, no. um, thank you, Minister. Um, just to um, briefly take you through um, the two distinct sets of guidance, um, in terms of the guidance for general FGM um, issues, um, that will uh, that will cover the status of the guidance, relevant persons and the aims of the guidance, an overview of the Scottish Government's approach to tackling FGM, a comprehensive summary of the issues around FGM, um, actions for chief executives, directors and senior managers to whom the guidance will apply, um, and information on definitions and language. And I suppose to um, address the issue about what, um, I suppose, where there is crossover and distinction in terms of the FGM protection order guidance, um, the latter will go more into what an FGM protection order is and how it is underpinned by legislation, um, roles and responsibilities of the different actors in relation to FGM protection orders, um, issues around costs, access to legal aid, how to apply, reporting a breach, um, supporting an individual at risk of FGM, um, and further information about indicators of risk for professionals. Um, so it certainly is the case that there, are, there is some crossover, um, but there is also um, strong distinction between the two different sets of guidance. No, uh, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that, that is very helpful, because th there will be a lot of crossover between the, the, the two sets of guidance. And, and, and I suppose, from my point of view, um, while there is crossover, if the two sets of guidance can almost stand alone but reference each other, so that, that people are in no doubt where they should go when they look at a particular set of guidance if the other, the other guidance is, is referenced. So yep. that's, that's very that's helpful, thank you. That's a good point. Thank you. And, and the monitoring, who, who will be responsible for ensuring the, gui the guidance is adhered to? Um, the... The National Implementation Group will be um, monitoring the, the work that, that we do around this. Um, we are, as we have I've said all the way through uh, this morning, we are intending to work incredibly closely with them in developing the guidance, which means that they've got some ownership of it. They've also got the responsibility to monitor it. It keeps it a bit independent as well uh, and, and, you know, keeps us and, and statutory authorities on, on their toes a bit if you know, the guidance needs updated and, and reviewed as it goes along. We're hoping to have something that's worked you know, really hard uh, that comes across as absolutely clear so that where you do have those reference points that professionals do know exactly where, where to go to as well, but also allows us in the monitoring process to measure it and measure the difference it's making too. Thank you. Um, last week we heard some um, very helpful um, evidence from Lethan Bartholomew of the National <coughs> Centre and, and he raised some issues around the training that professionals um, get and continue to get and I, I wonder, um, Minister, if you could tell us, do you intend to roll out training to um, professionals um, in, a, in addition to issuing the, the guidance and how will that training develop? Yeah, as you'll have seen in the financial memorandum that comes with, with the bill, we discussed um, uh, training with the, the relevant bodies and we're looking at where's the most efficient and effective method of delivering accessible and specialist training. On the bill, two local authorities and Police Scotland during the implementation of the bill. Now, what we're talking about in this part of the bill is protection orders, you know, so it's pretty specialised and it'll be a very small group of individuals across the whole of Scotland who would take uh, those forward. So uh, we anticipated, you know, some of that training um, uh, to take place in local authorities and with Police Scotland so that they understand what they need to do there. Um, it's also uh, in incredibly important uh, to be part of the statutory guidance. And again, you know, we, we are keen to work with within the legal framework to have a clear understanding of what we need to do, but to work with the implementation group and other uh, interested uh, bodies to make sure that that training is absolutely right. So there is ongoing training around about FGM in the wider policy area. This is about how do we use protection orders. And for some of the professionals, they will know how to use protection orders through forced marriage protection orders and child protection orders and adult protection orders so it'll not be you know an alien concept um, but maybe you know how focused uh, we need to be on this being a specific issue around about FGM is where we need to go with the training but you know again it's something that we're working on uh, to make sure we get right. And, and again we heard from Lethan Bartholomew last week that um, quite often professionals, health professionals didn't understand the threshold 
for ob obtaining the, pr the protection orders, and they've been used as a last resort rather than a first resort. And that's something obviously we want to avoid with, with this legislation. So how, how will you ensure that professionals know that that is a first resort and not a last resort, and they are well aware of what the thresholds are? ties into your earlier point about training and understanding and clarity, doesn't it? And in 2017, the, we published a multi-agency guidance um, on FGM in recognition of that fact um, uh, that statutory organisations need to equip themselves uh, and uh, their workforce with the necessary skills to understand the knowledge uh, to know what to do next and what to do first rather than maybe last uh, in this case, but to really effectively identify the issues here and respond appropriately. And again, that's you know we issued that guidance in 2017 we're now working with the National Implementation Group to make sure we get that right in the statutory guidance now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Angela. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Minister. Um, Minister, um, there's been a suggestion <coughs> from some of our witnesses um, that, based on the experience in England, that with FGM orders... Uh, there is a, a risk or a, a potential that it could uh, lead to racial profiling by professionals. And I just wondered whether you had a view on that, whether you agreed that there um, is a risk of that, and if so, you know, how, how would that be countered? So, yeah, I heard, I heard some of that evidence uh, myself too. And I have to say, I think we have to reject um, the assertion that the bill racially profiles people. I think the bill do doesn't do that. I think we need to understand that FGM is a form of abuse, child abuse and gender-based violence and everyone deserves to be protected from it. Um, we also know that FGM has been practised across many countries continents, communities and belief systems for about 5,000 5, years. And because of global, global migration patterns, it's something that, that happens globally now. So we agree also with the evidence that was given that language around these issues is incredibly important and we need to be very, very careful about how, how we use that and how we frame that language too. And we're going to consider um, very carefully after hearing that evidence how we develop our statutory guidance again and consult closely with the communities because I think uh, we don't want to, you know, create the, the idea that this, this could be, you know, racial profile or racialisation of, of a particular issue. But we do know that it FG, FGM's child abuse and everybody needs to be protected from that. And on that issue about wider awareness, um, the committee has heard examples of where affected women, um, you know, who are using maternity services, for example, um, have not, um, you know, been offered support or, you know, there's not been a, a dialogue entered by, by the professional. Um, and there was also the suggestion that uh, to avoid concerns about things like racial profile and that actually maternity services should be asking every woman, um, you know, the same core questions. So I, I just wondered if there was anything you wanted to say about, I suppose, how we're raising awareness um, across the community and uh, not, not, not just within uh, who we perceive to be an affected community. Well, it's why that, that training and that guidance to the professionals, especially frontline, like midwives and uh, obstetricians and do doctors and medical staff that be involved in that, who could broach that subject with some confidence, you know, uh, you know, and whether we ask everyone the same core questions or not will be, you know, something we can we can consider. But we also uh, need to consider if someone's at risk, we have to, con you know, equip our professionals with the tools that they need, and that needs to be entrenched in that very careful language that I've just spoken about, um, and that's why that work with the community and the organisations to support people in this situation will be absolutely key to making sure we get this right. Because the last thing we want to do is because a professional doesn't feel confident or maybe feels they could be, you know, accused of uh, racially profiling somebody, whatever, that, that they don't ask those questions. And that would be the most dangerous thing because then someone could be, you know, put at risk when actually a, a simple set of, you know, dialogue could have resolved the whole situation. Okay. And my final question, Minister, is that the committee also heard um, evidence that in England, as from September 2020, 
uh, there will be mandatory education on FGM. Now, we all know that um, in Scotland, um, we have a, a, a framework curriculum. Um, and I just uh, wondered uh, your views on how um, education and awareness within school settings could be taken forward. We've got curriculum for excellence, and there's a whole thread. Of, one of the pillars of curriculum for, for excellence is health and well-being. You may know that the Deputy First Minister has just in September um, um, you announced uh, a, a review and the new resources for the uh, I Never Get This Right relationships sexual health and parenthood. I always get the letters mixed up for some reason. It's just in, in my head in a different way. But that new um, it, guidance and resources for teachers, it was age appropriate for all ages and stages of young people. It was just released in September this year. Um, it includes examples of a lesson plan for third and fourth year pupils um, to deliver learning on sexuality and the idea of their rights, including FGM. So it's, it's embedded in the work that we're already doing. We're working very closely with Education Scotland because we think that's a, a point well made and uh, to implement the National Action Plan to prevent uh, FGM. So there's measures in there as well. And you may know that there's a, um, a national improvement hub has been created and the hub is a specific page on FGM which provides a brief description of uh, the issue, gives guidance and support uh, to senior leaders and practitioners on how to approach a case of FGM and work to develop this hub is ongoing. In consultation, again, uh, you'll have heard this from me a lot this morning, with members of the National Implementation uh, Working uh, Group uh, and all of the issues that they feel you know, could, could come up. So that brand new uh, resource is just uh, you know, over a month old um, and is now being used by uh, educators across the, the, the sector. But we are still working with Education Scotland to make sure that we're refining this all the time. OK, thank you, Convener. OK, um, Fulton McGregor. Convener, then. Uh, good morning, Minister. You've talked one of the um, consistent um, things that we've heard while we'll taking evidence in this uh, bill is about the importance of community involvement, particularly um, with the nature um, of FGM. You've also mentioned it in your opening speech, and you've mentioned it um, in, in several of your answers. Are you able to expand on how uh, the government is engaging meaningfully with um, communities across the country and will continue to do so? No, absolutely. And this, this is imperative. This has to be at the heart of everything that we do in such a sensitive subject, you know, that's been um, hidden uh, for a long time as well. It's sometimes really difficult. And in lots of cases, you know, families are having to deal with this within families as well. So community engagement, as I say, is absolutely the heart of our approach in tackling FGM. We want to empower communities, not uh, not disempower them, but also to allow them to challenge um, and tackle, you know, outdated attitudes um, that we think give rise to this gendered form of um, violence. Um, I do know that we need to do more in this area, and that's why those key groups are incredibly important in the work we're doing. And working in partnership also with third sector organisations, the community-based groups, um, building on those good relationships that we all already have. Um, during the consultation um, on strengthening the law, we worked with all of those stakeholders um, in engagement events across Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dundee. We received 74 responses in the consultation, 24 of them from, from individuals. So that, that shows you a real balance of uh, individual uh, interest in this. And as I said in my opening statement, um, we'll take forward a, a big engagement, uh, community engagement uh, piece of work. Because once when we develop this guidance and we raise the awareness of FGM protection orders, we want to make sure, as I said, my wee catchphrase about you know, nothing about them without them, uh, to make sure that we do that right. The implementation group and the National Action Plan group are meeting on the 20th of January. So we're not sitting on this um, right into the new year. Um, we, so we're looking at how, how do we work with them to co-produce what we need to do. Give these groups ownership seeking their help um, so you're looking you know reaching into the communities to make sure that we get this done the right way and meetings out and about to make sure that we understand what's happening and if you look at some of the young women that are involved in the Quiza group for instance um, the Kenyan women's um, group you will see that they are um, 
hungry for action um, and absolutely up for supporting us in doing that work and I've, I'm really grateful for them for doing that. Um, and the same with Waverly Care and Sahelia, really keen to get involved in this. So absolutely the community has to be at the heart of this. This can't be government sending down a set of guidance that doesn't reflect their needs, wants and some of the real sensitivities in their communities and that's incredibly important in this piece of work. And that's the, the big piece of work, I think it's the biggest piece of work we'll do going forward but the most important piece of work too. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that answer, um, Fulton, uh, sorry. sorry, just before you move on to your next um, topic, I'm going to bring in, and this is down to my chairing, not down to colleagues questioning, if we can go back to the um, schools a bit and if I can bring in um, my vice convener had a follow-up question on education. Thank you very much, convener. I won't take long, I'm sorry to cut across you, Fulton, um, but I wanted to come back to the question of education in schools, and you mentioned the RSHP guidance um, and you know the development that uh, relationship sexual health and parenting has had in recent years in the curriculum. Now, obviously, there is a lot to cover in those lessons, um, and, uh, and there may even be families who seek to withdraw their children from that that block of education within their school for, for cultural or religious reasons, and that does happen. And so we have to be mindful that we might not actually be reaching the people that we really need to if we're covering um, FGM in RSHP. Um, to that end, it strikes me there are similarities here with the, the need to uh, communicate with pupils about child sexual exploitation, and there has a, obviously been a very established work stream within government. And I just wondered whether um, what work uh, the minister thought there was, or, or what input that work stream had had into learning points that we can um, discern for the um, for, for FGM in terms of getting it, getting education using peer groups within schools to to get that education out there to children. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely, uh, good, good point. But it leads back to to the response that I just gave to to. to to Fulton McGregor there as well. The education approach we're taking is not the only single approach we're taking in this, and that work with communities will be key in this. Um, and in areas where maybe, as you, the example you use, where parents would maybe withdraw children from school, there's maybe other ways to reach uh, those individuals and those groups through some of the community groups that are involved there. So that's why that, you know, that involvement, that community, um, you know, driving uh, some of the, the work that we are doing is incredibly important because if we don't, you know, you know, get the right support and information and understanding in one way, we will hopefully get it in another way as well. So that's why it has to be the holistic approach and we have to take that, that stage um, stage approach to, to that. Um, peer groups and how peer groups work are incredibly important to this and that's why I drew attention to the young, uh, the Kenyan young women's group because they have been absolutely pivotal, I think, in ensuring that young women understand what their rights and the responsibilities are, but more importantly, give them the support because for some young women, you're challenging your own family structure and that can be incredibly difficult as well. And that, you know, can't, maybe can't be done in an education setting, but it can be done in a peer support setting. And that's why that group and the work that they do is incredibly important, which when we're taking forward, that's why they'll be at the heart of everything uh, that, that, that we do do. Thank you. Fulton, thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks again, convener. Going back to the um, follow-up to uh, my earlier question about community involvement, part of the, um, the, the committee's work involved going out to um, community organisations um, throughout the summer and what the organisation I visited in Glasgow um, specifically worked with men. I think that they might be the only, or maybe one of two, but I, I think they might be the only organisation um, in Scotland that does that. And, I, I just wonder if, if yourself or the Scottish Government have given any specific um, consideration to the role of men. Because what struck me at that visit was that you had individual after individual um, telling me that they were not aware that FGM had been an issue within their own families right up until they were well into adulthood of 30, 40, sometimes even older. And that it, it was really powerful and it, it, it really struck me. And it, it, it got me thinking, you know, this. How, how could this specific issue be addressed? No, it's a, it's a, a really good point. It's something that we have considered um, and something we're investing some funding in to make sure that, that those organisations are supposed to do that work. You maybe have heard when you were in your visit the Champions for Change uh, project that, that's ongoing right now, and that is men, uh, working with men and, and working... Um, uh, supporting men in order to change the cultures within their own communities as well. And a bit like White Ribbon Scotland and the work that they do in domestic violence, we felt it was incredibly important to make sure the men were involved in all of this as well. So there's a, the, there is that piece of work uh, go, going on. Um, and I'm just, is it 
70, I think it's £75,000 over the next three years to make sure that piece of work continues um, and going forward too. Because if we're going to do cultural change um, in an issue that's maybe very, very deep-rooted and very difficult maybe uh, to, to, you know, disclose for, for anybody, having, you know, all of the parts of that community on board is very important. And in some cases where the men are the leaders in some of those communities, the leaders taking that responsibility and being those champions for change will really drive forward some of the cultural change that we need to see too. Thanks. So, yeah, to completely support yeah, your point. Okay, thanks. I wanted to ask a question about Sorry, mm -hmm. yes, um, oh, um, um, Minister, I wanted to ask a quick uh, question on asylum. We've heard some evidence that... Um, and it's quite topical just now, obviously, with the um, horrendous situation that's happening in the circle and uh, asylum seekers uh, in, in Glasgow. But we heard some evidence during the, um, the, the committee sessions that FGM protection orders could possibly be used to assist uh, in asylum cases. Have you got any views on that? And uh, has there been any discussions with the UK government about this and how it might work in practice? So that was nice news to, to hear yesterday. Um, been one of the um, you know, first members of the Glasgow campaign to welcome the refugees all the years ago when I was a, a lowly unison rep and uh, to see you know, such a consideration yesterday was quite worrying. To also see that uh, public uh, services delivered by a private company seems to not be um, you know, covered by the Human Rights Act is, is a, a worry for me in my role too and it's something that I know Ms Campbell and uh, her CABSEC role was taken very seriously and something from a human rights point of view that I'll be looking at too. Uh, when considering a person's application uh, under the immigration system, we would fully expect that any risk for anyone, uh, including you know, a, 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 someone who already holds an FGM protection order, should be taken into account. And we do know that, 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 it, that, that it does happen uh, in relation to protection orders in the rest of the UK. Well, there's a clear risk of FGM, our view that, it, that this presents a strong argument, a very, very strong argument for that individual not being returned to their country of origin. Sadly, we have you know, seen some circumstances where the women and girls have been at risk. So we hope that the protection orders that are now in place in England and Wales and the protection orders as they will come into place in Scotland will protect those women from being um, you know, maybe sent back somewhere where they could be at risk. Uh, and that risk is the thing that determines their status and not anything else. Annie. Convener, good morning, Minister. Um, the Scottish Government has chosen to take a different approach to the UK Government by not introducing three provisions within the Bill. That is anonymity, failure to protect, and duty to notify police. Can you explain the reasons and what evidence uh, this was based on? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the evidence is the Scottish justice system is very, uh, you know, very different. We, we, you know, we're very proud of the fact that it's open and accessible, uh, that the courts have, uh, you know, the powers to ensure that protection orders of, um, the protection of any, you know, body in that situation in a relevant case. This, uh, in Scotland includes both civil and criminal cases too. Um, and I believe that automatic lifelong uh, anonymity would cut across those principles. And I'm uh, very uh, clear about that. I'm not convinced that anonymity is the right way to go. But Scottish courts do have a number of powers uh, in order to use uh, anonymity at the disposal for the protection of a person's uh, identity. And this includes being able to provide anonymity in circumstances that justify it. I'd also like to say something about Child, child, children, because if it's a child that's involved in the proceedings, there's further statutory uh, prohibitions available. And in most cases, identifying a child is automatically prohibited from being published. And I don't know if, if you remember the young woman who um, supported the, the launch of the bill, Nene, when she gave uh, her evidence in a lot of the work that she did uh, in public. One of the things that she told us at the time was if she wasn't able to speak publicly about this, then nothing would change. And I think we need to think very, very clearly about if we close down all the avenues for people to tell the story then we maybe not fully understand the impact of this issue so that's why we are not convinced about anonymity in this bill but absolutely convinced that the court has the power to offer those when the circumstances require it thank you um obviously we we have taken quite a lot of evidence with regards to the additional provisions um and a number of witnesses have indicated their support for the provision of automatic anonymity, including the Law Society, Police Scotland, and Leith, uh, Mr. Bartholomew last week. 
Um, what I would say is, would it not be worthwhile having the automatic anonymity there in the first place, and then people can choose to not, people can withdraw from that if they, if they choose? Um, I just think it's something from the from the evidence we've heard. I think that's probably the way that I see it working better for people that they can then choose to not have that anonymity. I was just wondering if the if the minister can say sort of a her her views on that, and would that be something that could be considered and going forward with this bill? See, I think I think we are, we are absolutely clear. The courts in Scotland have the power to grant anonymity when it's needed. And you need to balance that with the list of professionals that you've just given and what the stakeholders have, have told us. The, stake, the stakeholders are not keen about anonymity because it prevents them from telling uh, their story and from getting the, you know, the publicity around that, that we need to raise awareness and profile of this issue. It's been a secretive issue for such a long time. If we then further compound that with more uh, you know, measures put in place, unless it's necessary, and that's where the courts really should have the power. It shouldn't be for us as politicians to divide, decide whether somebody or, or their issue should remain anonymous or not. It should be for the courts to provide for that in the specific circumstances where it's necessary. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm not convinced at all by maybe some of the organisations. I'm more convinced by what the stakeholders have told us they need. Commentary on mm -hmm. anonymity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bring you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I, I, I just wonder, I mean, I, I, I hear you saying it's for the courts to decide. I guess my question would be, I mean, this is very personal uh, f for uh, victims and those, 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 those uh, who've gone through it. And I just wonder why it wouldn't be for them to decide why we would leave that to you know, a group of people in, in, in Scotland who, who maybe not who maybe not seen as being very representative of these communities to make a decision within a court setting rather than let the, the women and girls who are most affected by the issue decide whether or not it was made public. Well, they can. They can decide. Um, so if, if a woman or a girl in a circumstance whether they've been supported by an organisation or their, their legal team um, suggested that they needed anonymity, then I suspect a court would be quite happy to grant that on, on those grounds. So um, it's getting the balance right here that's important. So we can't, you know, just shut down everything. Um, we should have a circumstance where people have the choice, and that's where they do have the choice. So a local authority uh, or, you know, an individual themselves can ask for an anonymity to be put in place, and that's something that the court, I'm sure, would, would not be, you know, averse to granting. I think it's just some... Sorry. Can I ask, could the court refuse anonymity if somebody requested it? Um, I think in, in, in the circumstance where we may be talking about a vulnerable person or a child, I don't think I have ever experienced a situation where a court has rejected anonymity in that case, um, and I wouldn't suspect it in this case, given the sensitivities around it too. I think our court system are pretty well versed in um, these issues, and I think we, 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 should, we should have some um, trust in them doing the right thing. Sorry, Oliver, I jumped in. I, I was just going to ask, but do you not recognise that in order to go forward to that point you have to take a risk as an individual that, you're, you, that, that you might not get anonymity and that that's certainly a perception uh, among some of, the, some of the people we've engaged with that they, that they would have to disclose quite a lot of information about themselves with, with, no, with no guarantee and that they were going to have to justify why very intimate details about them should, shouldn't be shared publicly. Um, and then further to that, we, we also heard issues even with the existing provisions uh, where by identifying where someone lives, mm -hmm. um, that because of the nature uh, of, 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 of the community they come from, that it's still possible to identify them even without mm -hmm. uh, giving their name, um, and that people might, uh, you know, might take an interest or figure out even which court, uh, you know, their their case could be heard in. Um, is, is that something that the Scottish Government has given any thought to? It's, it's a really, you know, it's a tough one to get the balance right on. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, we already have the same circumstances in other situations, in other cases, you know, sexual assault or rape or anything else, where, you know, we, we already have some of these protections in place now. Um, I, I'm absolutely, you know, sure that the court would not put anybody at risk um, and actually would use their powers appropriately to make sure that people are protected. Um, your point about you know where someone lives or the community or being able to identify people is always something that, that we have to get the balance right on. I would hope 
and I would suspect and I would want uh, to make sure that anybody who is going forward with a case has the right support to do that. And that's where all of the other aspects of this uh, and, and support and guidance and how protection orders work um, would become paramount in, in all of this. So anonymity would not be the first thing that people would be supported um, or need support in, that all of the other things have been dealt with uh, beforehand. And that means when they do go to court and maybe seek anonymity or in the issue if it's a child, um, or a vulnerable person at risk, then the court would take the right action in the right circumstances. But those circumstances would be tailored to that individual, which I think is the most appropriate way to do this. Okay, um, Annie, just before you come back in, I've got some more supplementaries. Um, Angela. Um, thank you, convener. Um, Minister, um, there are obviously arguments for and against automatic anonymity in the same way that there are arguments for and against automatic uh, legal aid. But I wondered, um, in your view, whether you seen it as possible or problematic that for a, a change for one particular group of survivors um, and victims in one particular bill was desirable or whether those who were advocating changes of this nature, whether it's a more fundamental change uh, to be sought in a legal system that's a more productive route. Yeah, I think um, the, the same people like the Law Society and that who gave you evidence on one part of this would be um, you know, interested if we open up and change the system uh, for one aspect um, of even just gender-based violence um, and the ramifications that would have right across the, the whole of the justice system. So that's where that getting that balance right ha has to come into play. And I think uh, the procedures that we have in place in Scotland, I think, are very robust. They're very supportive, and uh, you know, courts are, are very well, well versed in this. So I would suspect, you know, that the provisions that we put forward now, I think, are the right ones. I also believe that you're absolutely right. You know the ramifications across the justice system of one small change here and the impact that could have in, in many many areas would may, ha may have unintended consequences that we maybe don't want to see um, but you're, you're right about getting the balance right and understanding this and I think the, the position that we have right now is the right one. Okay. Are you content? Okay um, Minister that um, draws our session to a close. Can I thank you um, and your officials very much. Um, at our next meeting on the 21st of November, the committee will hold an evidence session on race equality in Scotland. And I now move us into private session.